You know, it's probably hard to imagine today that we didn't always live and work and produce through large formal organizations. And in fact, if you look at the history of humanity, of us, we can see that the whole concept of wage labor, the idea that we sell our time and our efforts for money to somebody else is a fairly recent phenomenon, probably about 300 years, depending on who you talk to. But in terms of human history, it's a fairly small period of time. And it doesn't mean that all those thousands of years that we've been around, we were sitting around doing nothing, right? We created lots of incredible stuff. We grew food. We made things. We produced things. We traded things. We bought things. But we did it all on a small scale. We did it within our communities, within our geographic areas. We knew who we were buying stuff from. We knew who we were selling things to. So our economic relationships were highly embedded in our social relationships. They were inseparable. And really, the genius of a large organization, of a large formal organization like this, is that they managed to scale up production. Beyond your community, beyond your geographic area, you could produce lots and lots of things. And in the process, actually, we separated the economic and the social context, right? So you have no idea who built the chair you're sitting on right now, right? Well, it probably was built by a machine anyway. Or the clothes that you made. So it allowed us to basically scale up production to these great limits beyond what we were capable to do before. So why did we need organizations? What is it about organizations that allowed us to scale up production? Well, this is the question that Ron Coase, who was a Nobel Prize economist, asked in his famous paper in 1937. He asked the question, why do we need organizations of any kind, corporations, governments, other uh, universities, colleges? And his answer was, it's because of transaction costs. Because when you're producing more, when you're creating more stuff, when you're scaling up, you need to manage a lot more people. You need to manage a lot more resources. You need to invest a lot more. So it makes sense from the efficiency point of view to bring it all under one umbrella, right? So it's about these transaction costs. So you can think of organizations in a way as a kind of a technology. It's a technology that allows us to scale up production while minimizing costs of doing so and increasing profits. And that, I think, exactly what is becoming disrupted today. These transaction costs are being disrupted. And here's why. It's really because of the kind of technology infrastructure that we've been putting in place really for the last 40, 50 years. I love this graphic. This comes from Paul Barron, who was one of the founders of the Institute co-founders of the Institute for the Future and also developer of packet switching technology. You're all techies, so you all know about packet switching. He wrote this when he was at RAND, and what he was suggesting is moving from a centralized telecommunications infrastructure, which is what we had today, to a decentralized, to a highly distributed. And in distributed one, large chunks of data are broken down into smaller pieces, into packets, and they, they can travel down multiple paths, so any time one node is taken out, it can find its way it's in an, through another node, uh, and it's reassembled at the end. So basically, it's a much more resilient, much more emergent infrastructure that we've created, and this is really the internet. This is what is becoming part of our lives. This is what we use on a daily basis. And the interesting thing about it is that this infrastructure is dramatically changing our transaction costs. So all of a sudden, it becomes possible for individuals or a few people to reach the kind of scale, the kind of markets, the kind of possibilities that previously you needed a large organization to do, or sometimes no organization could do. So what's possible, I think what's happening and is that increasingly we're starting to create value in new ways. If you think of production as creating value, 
is if you think of organizations as the central nodes, and by no means I suggest that the organizations will go away, or all organizations are going away, and it sounds like Google will be here forever, but a lot of other value is created in these new ways. So we're seeing emergence of platforms like Uber and Lyft and many other platforms that are allowing people to basically do things in new ways. And increasingly, we're seeing this much more distributed form of production. We're seeing it a lot in social movements where there seems to be no center, no core. Look at what's happening in Hong Kong. And people are able to organize in these completely new ways. So I think about it almost like, if you think about an individual as this one node, it becomes possible for an individual to aggregate resources and collaborate with others and create this value in really new ways that we haven't seen before. So this is what I mean by social structing, which is that highly distributed mode of production. It's about creating value by aggregating small contributions, and small doesn't need to be small. It may be 15 minutes of your time. It may be a day of your time. You think about Wikipedia and how that's been created. But it's using large social networks, and it's um, using social tools and technologies to do that. So as we're moving, as I said, I'm not saying that all the organizations are going to go away. It's just that some of the economic basis for why these organizations exist may no longer be there. The transaction costs are changing. That's one thing. And the second thing is that new forms of value creation are emerging, and we're seeing this today. And as we're seeing these new forms of value being created, we're also seeing emergence of new kinds of workers. At the Institute for the Future, we um, look a lot at signals. We look at people who are doing weird things, who look like they're on the fringes, or new technologies, or new scientific discoveries, and constantly ask ourselves a question, what is it a signal off? Is it a noise, or is this an important signal? So we've been studying what we call these uh, new kinds of workers to understand why they're doing what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what are the signals they're sending us in from their behaviors. So I just want to share four archetypes of these kinds of workers. One is uh, micro workers. There's been a lot of discussion in uh, the press about these people. These are people who may be signed on on five, four or five different platforms, from TaskRabbit to Lyft to Uber to Ship. There seems to be a new platform coming out every day. Probably some of you in the audience are building them. And so these people are signed up, and basically instead of the employer telling them, you have to be there here 9 to 5 or 8 to 6 or whatever time, they make themselves available when they have the time. So a driver may decide, I'm going to work today from 4 to 6 in the morning uh, as an Uber driver because I can make more money that way, or that's my time that's available. So they're determining their own schedule. They're in control of their times in many ways. And the other signals they're sending us is that there changes the whole notion of work. To them, work is a series of tasks that they stitch together into something that, to make a living. So that's one kind of worker. The other kind of worker um, is what we call an amplified entrepreneur. So you think of these people as that node in that distributed network who are able to aggregate all the resources they need to achieve scale. So these are people who are maybe using these micro-workers. They basically outsource and use all of those platforms. They use accountants. Uh, they use Odesk for ed editing. They may use travel people, all of these other resources. They may be sitting at home in their pajamas, but they're in charge of an army of people who are doing things for them. And all of a sudden, they're able to accomplish these amazing things. And so what these people are signaling to us is that in some areas, not in all areas, it's possible for one person or a few people to achieve the kind of scale that previously you needed a whole organization to achieve or no organization could do before. So that's another kind of um, worker. The other kind of archetype that we've looked at is what we call the dream builder. So these are people who are basically separated completely what they do to earn money 
and where their passions are. So they may be working in companies, they may be working, some of them, microtasking and other things, but that's not where they're finding their meaning. They may be finding their meaning in a tech shop in the evening in the community where they're building something new, or in maker spaces, or in hacker spaces, or in art studios, but they've totally separated kind of meaning from making money. And what they're telling us, and the question it, it begs is, what is these people not bringing to work, like Laszlo said? How do you make this environment that people do bring the best of themselves into their workplaces? Because it's amazing what these people are producing with no money, with no pay. And there's a lesson somewhere there for us. They may not be bringing the best of themselves into organizations. And the last archetype I would want to share with you is what we call a culture hacker. It's very uh, probably known here in Silicon Valley, I don't know about other places. But unlike these other people who've separated work and uh, meeting, these people want to hack all the organizational structure. They want to remake what work is about and what life is about and what leisure and learning and all of these places. These are people who are creating co-housing spaces in San Francisco, like the Embassy Network, that's really hard to qualify what it is. There are people co-living there, but there's also a company being created in that space. And it's also a convening place, and they do a lot of lessons there, and you can learn coding there. What are these places? Or a place like um, Free Space, created by Mike Zuckerman, which is a space warehouse for social experimentation that created this huge community, and there are a lot of interesting things happening in that. So these people are basically what I think they're doing and the signals they're sending us, these are people who are redefining what work is, what life is, what leisure is, what learning is. They're stitching it together in completely new ways. And what's really interesting about them is these are the people who are actually bringing back that social and economic, all of these back together, which we've separated for a long time, for 300 years. So as we look at the future, and I know there are a lot of issues. We haven't worked out how this will work, how micro work, and what does it do to risk, and who bears the risk. But it's important to remember that it took us probably decades to work out during industrialization all of the social protections and all of these things around us. We don't know. We, we're going to be working them out. This is our job for the next 10, 20, and probably more years as more and more people are choosing these alternative pathways. Thank you.